All right, I believe we are live. Hello, everybody. Hello. So yeah, I'm ready. This is Ali Naba Vizade. Hopefully, I got that right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, so he's a hey. dinosaur anatomist and also chair of the um, diversity committee at um, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Excellent. So, um, what are you going to share with us today, Ali? Uh, so today I thought I would share some of my research on, you know, reconstructing cranial musculature and just looking at feeding mechanisms in some herbivorous dinosaurs, mostly ornithischians. But, um, you know, I welcome questions throughout if there are any. But, uh, yeah, I just thought, you know, show some slides, see, you know, go through it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure how I've never used uh, oh. Skype's uh, uh, share screen. Yeah, yeah. Before. So there's a share screen function down below. Do you see it? Uh, Is that, oh, yes. Got it. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you click on that and then you, okay. it'll got ask it. you to confirm again and then. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes. You, uh, yep. See my screen? Okay. I, perfect. I can see it. Yep. Mm. Great. Okay. Let's do this. All right. So. Uh, so basically, my, my research since you know, since my grad school years has always been looking at uh, feeding me feeding mechanisms and cranial, dental, and muscular traits in herbivorous dinosaurs, specifically ornithischians. Although lately, I've kind of been exploring um, other dinosaur groups as well. Um, so I've I've always been really interested in just the diversity of anatomy and just kind of looking at the intricate details that not not only the differences between groups of dinosaurs, but within them as well. Uh, because we see a lot of little key differences that actually have a big impact on how these animals are feed were feeding. Uh, so, I guess, so, I mean, you know, going all the way back to the 1800s when Dullo first started looking at, you know, thinking about reconstructing cranial muscles in dinosaurs, he kind of categorized different dinosaurs into two different categories. There's the, quote, crocodilian condition, mm -hmm. and there's the lizard-like condition. Uh, the difference being that the crocodilian condition, quote, unquote, things uh, like some sauropods like Diplodocus, which right here, as well as theropods like the Ceratosaurus right here, had weaker temporal muscles. So these muscles in the temp te uh, temple region that originate up here and then go and insert onto the coronoid eminence or coronoid process um, down on the mandible right here behind the teeth. Uh, these are the temporal muscles. And in these animals, he um, he kind of noted that there was, would be weaker, they're smaller, versus the palatal muscles, which are originate in the palate within the skull here and then wrap around into the back of the mandible. So he's... Uh, you know, he noted that in crocodilian condition, you'd have much larger palatal muscles, as you see in this uh, crocodilian right here. You can see here's the palatal muscle stretching from in here, re attaching to this big region back here, and then temporal muscles are much smaller here. Uh, the, versus the lizard-like condition, he talked about in things like ornithopods, um, like the like this um, Edmontosaurus and Iguanodon. Um, He'd say, um, he noted that their temporal muscles are much larger compared to the weaker palatal muscles, so kind of in reverse. The temporal muscles are good for lifting the jaw up initially, mm -hmm. and the palatal muscles are actually good for more of the grinding and the crunching down much more forcefully. So it, it kind of gives a basic idea of, okay, what, were the, what was the feeding apparatus used for more so and one or the other. Um, but... You know, this has a lot of problems with it, and especially when you look at a lot of other dinosaurs, you see a lot of issues just, like, kind of categorizing it between these two, mm -hmm. uh, you know, animals. So, you know, ever since, there have been many, many studies on, you know, reconstructing cranial musculature in uh, dinosaurs and prehistoric animals in general, because many researchers have been really interested in just how these animals were eating, you know, what was their feeding apparatus like. We, we have the bones, that's great, but what do those bones tell us about the muscles? And their, and then from there, how did the muscles, what did the muscles tell us about how they ate? Uh, so more recently, uh, kind of a methodology that's kind of been structured 
through different, you know, ways throughout the past decades has finally gotten a name and became more structured. It's called extant phylogenetic bracketing. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is basically you're looking at different animals of, you know, that are, that are living today that are were closely related to the dinosaurs that are extinct. Now, obviously, birds are dinosaurs themselves, mm -hmm. so they're the most obvious choice to look at their cranial muscles to see how they're attached to the skull. But other, also things like crocodilians, like this alligator down here, um, they're, you know, they're also archosaurs, so they are very much related to dinosaurs, and so it's good to look at them and their muscle uh, attachment sites. And it's also helpful to look at things like lizards and turtles, because they can give you insights into certain features of the jaw that maybe you know birds that are really have a really modified skull don't show you so there's there's certain aspects of different animals that can help you understand uh, things like for instance there are some guardians with a coronary process you know things like birds and alligators don't really have a coronary process so mm -hmm. if you're looking at a guardian you can see okay well how does muscle attach when there's a coronary process so on and so forth um so I specifically have mostly looked at ornithischians on this side of the tree. I'm sure, you know, I don't have to go through <laughs> dinosaur evolution. But basically all these animals over here are what I've focused on. Um, as you know, they're, you know, it's a vastly diverse group of animals. Mm -hmm. Things like horned ceratopsians, plated and spiked stegosaurs, and armored ankylosaurs, pachycephalosaurs, duckbilled quote duck build uh, mm -hmm. uh, ornithopods like or ornithopods and hadrosaurs within them like this Paris Ralph so on and so forth uh, so lots of different cranial and postcranial adaptations in these animals and a lot of these adaptations have to do with feeding in some to some capacity first wh whether it's you know in how they ate and how they um, obtained the food or how they defended themselves if something else is trying to eat them or you know just any there's a number of ways that these animals have adapted to uh, their, you know, ecosystem mm -hmm. um, that have to do with feeding in some capacity. So feeding is a big, big part of, you know, life in general. <laughs> and so um, you need to be uh, equipped, well-equipped for it. Um, so, you know, recent studies and things like dental microware have also been, have been really helpful in understanding feeding mechanisms. Uh, in herbivorous dinosaurs especially. So as, as far as looking at orientation, what types of foods they're eating, you know, is it woody and grainy or is it a lot more soft, you know, things like that. You know, pits versus scratches and what do those tell you um, about the diet. So you can see here, for instance, here are the ankylosaurs. They have these like more, quote, leaf-shaped teeth, although, you know, what does leaf-shaped mean? Mm -hmm. You can go into the specific, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they, they're, quote, leaf-shaped, but also have a really denticulate rim. Lots of denticles, these little tooth-like things on top of it. Um, so these are good for, uh, and you can see here the dental microware, this uh, kind of this fore aft and um, kind of feeding uh, mm -hmm. orientation, and these, these kind of show you exactly, like, uh, what orientation you can uh, these animals were using. So there's some fore aft and so also some up and down feeding orientation. Same thing with hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. They use different orientations for different capacity. And uh, things about the special thing about hadrosaurs and ceratopsians is they have these huge dental batteries, especially the hadrosaurs. Mm -hmm. can have thousand, uh, over a thousand teeth in their mouth. Um, and they all kind of pack together into this you know, call these columns of teeth just kind of pushed together. And the top of it forms this really kind of a smooth occlusal surface so that they can grind the plant material while they're feeding. And you can see these scratches here and, um, you know, both up and down and uh, uh, kind of forward, fore aft, or sorry, aft, uh, backward motion. So palinal feeding is what it's known as. Um, so different variations in the amounts of orientation. Uh, so, you know, looking at the jaws of these animals, just tons of different adaptations, just a huge diversity just among ornithischians and themselves. Uh, you know, you have really small coronoid eminence here. This starting is a coronoid eminence or coronoid process versus really tall coronoid process in things like ceratopsids, um, like the centrosaurus or triceratops or hadrosaurus like in Montosaurus and Verzoralopus. Really tall coronoid process versus small ones here. Now, what does that mean? Well, a tall coronoid process means 
a certain set of those temporal muscles have a much larger attachment site with more uh, more surface area to attach as well as kind of it reorients the muscle vectors so that mm. the mechanical advantage is increased. So the moment arm increases. I can show you, I'll show, I think a, there's a slide that shows moment arm. But it basically it helps it for more efficient feeding. Um, and you can see the tooth rows. Some of their tooth rows are curved, like this ankylosaur, um, both kind of upward and downward, as well as kind of sinusoidal, if you look at them from above. So just lots of different um, adaptations. One of my favorites is the predentary bone. It's this one unique bone that ornithischians skins have in the front of their jaw. Um, all shapes and sizes. Again, ceratopsians have a pointed one, and ankylosaurs have this like bar-like rod that it's you look at you look at these animals in the museum and just kind of look at the predentary at the front of the jaw. You'll notice a lot of times uh, in things like ankylosaurs and especially hadrosaurs, mm. that bone is just kind of floating there. Mm. It doesn't clasp on very well, um, and so that means that there's some kind of like either fibrocartilaginous tissue or something that's making them hang on. But that means that there there's a good possibility there's some amount of flexibility in. Um, and so my research, and, and to that extent, things like hadrosaurs might have had like, you know, mediolateral um, twerking mm -hmm. or a rolling of the jaws on either side, both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different morphotypes, I won't get into that, but just different types of predentary, um, predentary, denary kind of orient, uh, articulation. Denary is the main lower jaw bone on the side. Mm -hmm. um, now, what, th what this is great for, especially in things like hadrosaurs and uh, ankylosaurs, is that this allows these animals to chew, quote-unquote, on both sides of the jaw at the same time. You know, if you think about if you eat a salad or eat most of the food you eat, you're, you focus on one side of the jaw because those muscle, um, bite, those uh, chewing muscle forces are going through your chin and focusing on that bite point. But if you have a predentary there, you kind of focus those forces on either side because there's another bone for those forces that, that they would need to pass through. So it kind of like uh, uh, diffuses those forces and focus that focuses those muscle forces on each side of the jaw separately. So they can really start to chew their food on both sides of the jaw at the same time. Um, so for instance, here's a uh, hadrosaur. You can oh, see yeah. kind of the rolling of the lower jaw. This is uh, created by a good friend of mine, Elizabeth Cook, who's mm -hmm. a brilliant medical illustrator. Um, this, this was years ago that she made this wow. with me. Um, mm -hmm. You can see the rolling of the of the uh, denaries against the pre denary. Um, so you can see it's chewing on both sides. I can kind of go to this ankylosaur. You can mm -hmm. see the same thing. Wow. You know, it's kind of it, and ankylosaurs is kind of this like simultaneous palinal retraction mm -hmm. and curling of the jaw. So you can see it just kind of moving with the pre denary. Right. So. So really fascinating feeding apparatuses that is very unique to ornithischians. You know, yeah. nothing, pretty much nothing that's especially an herbivore, but nothing has a predentary today other than select few tiny, tiny bones and a few, tiny, you know, frogs or something that mm -hmm. you know mostly help in like when tongue flipping. They right. kind of right. unlatch and they tongue flip, but you know, nothing like nothing like big herbivores have, that have predentaries. So, mm -hmm. um, and one of the other things that ornithischians are known for they're known for a lot of different features mm -hmm. uh is something called uh, a buccal a buccal emargination basically a, a tooth row that's inset so it's not along the outer margin of the jaw so much as it's kind of pushed inward on both sides you can see there's this cavity here um so here's the teeth and here's the outer rim of the uh jaw and this has been the this kind of ridge right here that you see um, this outspacing has been used as an, for some people to argue that there was an extra cheek muscle, mm. uh, kind of a novel structure, like a mammal cheek, mm. a buccinator, that, in which basically they say, oh, it helps keep, keep the food in the jaw mm -hmm. while they're mm -hmm. chewing, you know, it, it, as if that's what the buccinator is for, which that's not actually what the buccinator is for. But... Um, Basically, it's this whole new muscle that reptiles don't have. It's a, it's a strictly mammalian thing. Mammals have face muscles of facial expression. Um, but it would, they would have had to develop it, which is possible, you know, but it's a stretch. And so, and other, other uh, 
you know, explanations for this outer ridge has been given as well, like, you know, keratinous beak all the way back to the back of the jaw, mm -hmm. maybe another orientation of the muscle, so on and so forth. But, um, and also it's been kind of a point of contention as far as paleo art and say, like, yeah. do these animals have cheeks or are they lips, quote unquote, all the way back? They're not, you know, lips are not, it, it, I put lips in quotes and cheeks in quotes because the definition is just a big mess yeah. that. Right. You know, people just tend to take away, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, so, but, you know, it's like, did they have a lip that lip line that goes all the way back? Did they have a big cheek or did they just have nothing and have mm -hmm. this really sunken in looking? Mm -hmm. thing? Anyway, um, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a look at this. Why not? Because I'm interested in, you know, jaw muscle reconstruction and things like that. Um, and, you know, in previous reconstructions, uh, summarized by a holiday here, you can see that the temporal muscles are all attached onto the top, on this, the back of this coronoid process. You know, it's, it's a relatively, you know, good sized muscle. Um, but, you know, it, the, the problem I, I feel, the, the problem, the issue that I see with it is that you have all these muscles in the back, but to have something like palinal chewing, you, you need more of leverage, kind of like attaching more forward somewhere on the jaw for there to be leverage. You know, things that are pro wall, which are forward oriented or palinal, which are backward oriented. Basically my idea was like, well, you can't have something that has a jaw like a T-Rex or jaw muscles like a T-Rex that feeds like a, a hadrosaur or feeds mm -hmm. like a ceratopsian, you know, something there's got to be something different. Mm -hmm. Something, something's missing for me, but you know, most most recent studies have said, you know, there's no new cheek muscle. There's no need for it, you know, so on and so forth. So this has been the basic jaw muscle reconstruction. Um, it's like, you know, so I looked at it. What does it take to have pro wall forward or palinal feeding? Mm -hmm. Well, pro wall feeding, you know, things like elephants and rodents and uh, tuatara ha all have a kind of a pro wall feeding mechanism. They push their jaw forward to an extent. And if you look at them, things like an elephant, they kind of rotate their skulls so that their masseter is attaching more forward. Mm. Um, and it kind of covers over the teeth. This illustration I did is too old. These muscles should be stretching to here. <laughs> um, and then this ro a rodent also has this zygomatical mandibularis muscle, which mm. attaches forward onto a big ridge here. And there's actually a lateral dentary ridge that rodents have on the dentary as well, mm. on the lower jaw as well. Um, so it gives a bigger muscle attachment, a lot more forward. And tuatara have a, a, a more forward head of a palatal muscle that other lizards don't have. Mm. It's kind of a, a, an extra muscle body that sits even more forward. So that's for pro all. Palinal feeders, interestingly enough, we don't have, there are no living palinal feeders that we know of. Wow. Um, yeah, it's really bizarre. Either we have transverse feeding in mammals mm -hmm. or pro, some pro all feeding in these animals. But other than that, it's just like, you know, chomp swallow kind of thing uh but nothing living that we know of that's a palinal feeder now there are dicynodonts which have had their muscles reconstructed also on a lateral dentary ridge now mm -hmm. this is this is where um it, it really this relates to dinosaurs dicynodonts are unique in that they have a temporal muscle that attaches a lot more forward on the side of the jaw and when dicynodonts still had teeth um, like a little bit of teeth, this jaw muscle would attach lateral to those teeth. And then dicynodonts lost teeth altogether. Mm -hmm. So that's a different story. But before that happened, they still had jaw muscles that attached forward. Now these animals have been, um, they're greatly, uh, accept it's, a it's accepted that they were palinal feeders. Everyone pretty much agrees that they were palinal feeders. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that in their jaw joint, there's like this rolling jaw joint that dicynodonts have. And and their temporal muscle attaches way forward on the lateral aspect, just on this little ridge that looks very suspiciously like the ridge that we see in ornithischians, especially in ceratopsids. Uh, Multituberculates also are palinal feeders, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. They have this big uh, blade-like tooth, and their, their uh, temporalis muscle extends forward as well, lateral to dentition. This is where the temporalis ends. I uh, see the coronoid process kind of continues lateral to the teeth here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very similar kind of ideas. And, you know, basic concepts and mechanics, you know, if you have an orthal or just an up and down feeding, all those muscles are kind of constricted in the back, mm -hmm. whereas things that are a little more forceful or need more power behind them in general, 
kind of spread out that muscle. They have a much bigger muscle um, going down the length of the skull. So it dissipates those uh, joint reaction forces a little bit through the skull. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a general thing that herbivores do here. Then his figure, it's a carnivore, carnivorin. But um, herbivores do this especially well because they need to really be able to grind vegetation. So their muscles are generally forward on them. More so. so I looked at ceratopsians, and lo and behold, you know, this is where, you know, in previous reconstructions, those muscles would be attached way back here. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, you look here, this ceratopsians and other ornithischians have this unique kind of flaring cheekbone, the jugal. It flares outward, which is not something you see in like theropods or sauropods but you can see that it brings this like it creates this pocket here it's like this open area but those muscles would be attaching here so what's all this about you know there are no nerves or arteries that are like that big or that would need to pass through in this empty space like that uh so you know is it just a pocket of mucosa or what's going on so but then i kind of looked at it you know i was like you know looking at it at 1 a.m. one morning, just this, I was looking at, <laughs> I don't know why I was looking at dinosaur specimen photos, and I was like, hold on, what if there was a muscle that came forward and attached here, mm. you know, instead of attaching there, which that one, the most super, the most outer, outermost muscle would have been really small otherwise and just attaching back here. Mm. Yeah. What if it wasn't small? What if it was actually really big and attached way forward? And the muscle would stick out through this flaring jugal, this unique you know, feature, mm -hmm. and go straight to here. Um, and you can see here here it is. That It would be like a fan of muscle. You can see here, lateral to the coronoid process is where this uh, lateral ridge is actually starting. And this shelf kind of continues on to here in all of these animals right here. You see that? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, and in this as well, it's just like this continuous surface. So, mm. when I thought, hey, you know, that's interesting. Um, so I thought, well, what if instead of the traditional reconstruction that's like this, without a cheek muscle, obviously, where this muscle, the most out, the outermost temporal muscle, the superficialis, is just this little muscle that attaches here. Mm. What if instead it's like that? where it fans out like that and is able to actually lift the jaw as one element and pull it back, just as a palinal feeder does, like dicynodonts, which have a very, very similar-looking muscle. Mm -hmm. So, temporal muscle. So I thought, you know, that, and you know, you look at the f features that are related to recon reconstructing that muscle, you notice you know, they, they do fit, you know? You, you just draw a line from here through that jugal artery and it, uh, jugal opening and it just goes to this exact same region where the origin would be not only that the origin of this muscle would be all throughout this big um p part of the bone right here this infratemporal fenestra is really shrunken in ceratopsians and pushed downward so usually in a lot of animals it's really big so the muscle would attach here but if this fenestra is moved down it gives a lot more attachment area for this big muscle to start at so you know a lot of things that kind of match that kind of uh, structure. So helpful in palinal feeding. Um, so here's the new reconstruction. You know, go see my paper for, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and here's an ankylosaur just to show, you know, you look at a, a, the CT scan of an of Yoplocephalus, you can notice there's like a tunnel. So their, their temporal region is kind of slanted backwards. So this tunnel-like adductor chamber is actually oriented forward. Mm. But this coronary process is really far back. Mm. If you flip this around, it's like it doesn't make sense that this muscle would spread out like this, but right. the coronary process is just this tiny little nubbin. Mm. So I thought, well, what if that mu there's a, a layer of muscle that's going all the way to here? These animals were also palinal feeders. We know this through their tooth. So there got to be something helping them in palinal feeding. It can't be that all the muscles are constricted back there, in my opinion. But you know, this needs. We still need to have this, you know, tested computer modeling, which we're working on trying to get uh, resources for that. But, um, yeah, so, you know, hydrosaurs, same idea, although hydrosaurs don't have as big of a jugal flaring, but um, there's still a little bit of a pocket that maybe a, a layer of muscle might have gone through. And their animal, these animals are palinal feeders as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, the jugal looks like it's kind of sitting on the side of the coronoid process, but this could be there could be a number of reasons for that. Um, I know some histology of infants have said there's some cartilage there, mm -hmm. but it, was, it, it doesn't seem like with the feeding mechanism they have that 
in adults, this coronoid process would be sitting there. And a lot, and in a lot of cases, that jugal isn't sitting on top of the coronoid. So it might just be like deformation that happens to skulls. It just kind of presses them together. Mm-hmm. But you know, who knows? Like if I'm wrong, fine. If it's proven wrong, fine. If it's it's a hypothesis, you know. Mm-hmm. If, it's, <laughs> if it if it works well, great. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's you know just a an idea. Um, so before and after, he's this banshee looking mm-hmm. triceratops here with a big uh, buccinator like muscle, and here's the new reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and it, also, I've looked at different traits in a whole bunch of herbivorous dinosaurs uh, that these uh, traits that relate to jaw muscle anatomy, uh, you know, the temporal region, adductor chamber, palate, coronoid process, all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, I've looked at mechanical advantage in my 2016 paper mm-hmm. here. So here's the muscle vector. The muscle, the moment arm is the perpendicular arm to that muscle vector. So however long this arm is, is what the moment arm is. Mm-hmm. So if the muscle vector was further caudally, this moment arm would be shorter mm-hmm. because that, that this, it takes less, it's a, it's a smaller length for it to reach that. So we take the moment arm and then divide that by the output, which is basically from the jaw joint to a diff- each tooth point, uh, depending on what bite point you want to look at the mechanical advantage for. And in this, you know, this 2D lever arm stuff, you don't have, we don't have muscle mass data, so I can't incorporate that. So really we're looking at relative bite force across things like one of his Um So, you know, here on the left is the pre-denary, the, bite, the relative bite force of the pre versus on the right is the distal most tooth, the back tooth here. Um, so the red, the redder the color, the higher the mechanical advantage, the more blue, the lower the mechanical advantage. So it's like warm to cool colors. You can see there's a lot of variation across thyreophorins. So these armored dinosaurs, like stegosaurs and ankylosaurs, so like not only between groups, but also within groups. You know, ankylosaurs have showed this really broad range of diversity within you know in their mechanical advantage and uh you know scolitosaurus which is a more kind of basal thyreophora and this animal right here actually has the highest mechanical advantage of all for most of so that's interesting Mm, yeah it's a so they have this ortho sheer sorry um ortho kind of this uh crushing mechanism Mm. it's like kind of like that yeah so they, they need a lot more of a forceful feeding uh, apparatus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and I looked at just different traits, and I looked at just... I'm not going to talk about the features here, but you can see like, things like within stegosaurs, you know, the more basal stegosaur here, herangosaurus, has a much more... Uh, probably had a bigger fan of mm. the most temporal muscle than the stegosaurus did. Mm. And, you know, and they have a tooth row that extends the entire length of the skull versus yeah. stegosaurus versus the tooth row is more constricted in the front. So there's different things happening here. Um, so, you know, recently we found out that stegosaurs were sort of palinal feeders as well. There's some retraction in their feeding mechanism, which was which has surprised a lot of people. So um, ornithopods, you can see here the most basal, basal ornithopods are really low in their mechanical advantage. Mm. But then when you hit hadrosaurs, right. you get the growth of that coronoid process, and instantly you've got mechanical advantage that's a lot higher. Um, now, this is a significant difference here, although I'm, you know the, the robustness of my statistics is really, really low. So I'm not. I, it's more of a story, right. kind of like helping a story rather than like definitive results. But in the right. specimens I have in here, that's what it turned out to be. Mm. Um, and here are the different traits for them. You can see the diversity here. Mm. I won't, again, I won't talk about it. It's a lot really, you know, probably too, uh, bland for now, mm-hmm. but please you see, see, see my paper 2020 it just got published. Um, yeah. and then same thing in ceratopsians where the basal most animals have a lower mechanical advantage, but then you hit the ceratopsids with the big horns and frills and much larger body sizes with the coronoid process and instantly their mechanical advantage has grown as well. Now there's a quote significant difference in there is a feeding uh, apparatus but then when you look at ceratopsids um, and here's another trend in ceratopsids and pachycephalosaur here um, now if you look overall you can see that 
here in the ceratopsids and the hadrosaurs, they're mm-hmm. very similar. Yeah. And when you kind of look at them statistically, and it's not only my study, it's also Mellon and Anderson found this as well, there's no real significant difference between their feeding mechanics mm-hmm. and the efficiency of their jaw system. They're very similar. But they're each mecha- significantly different than their basal mm-hmm. uh, groups. So they're kind of convergently getting, gaining this mechanical advantage in their jaw is with a similar kind of feeding uh, upper, uh, structural you know, relationships of different parts, the craniodental features. Um, now, if you look down here, thyreophorans, like these uh, armored dinosaurs, very, very low compared to ornithopods and uh, marginocephalians. So they're eating you know, much you know, lower, softer material, not as... Uh, they weren't probably weren't eating as tough material as the hydrosaurs and ceratopsians were. Um, yeah, and you see these differences. The special thing about coronoid process is uh, basically a good, a big reason probably for this increased mechanical advantage is instead of being at a normal third class lever in which mm. the bite point is in front of the muscle vector, yeah. all of a sudden you have a two throw in ceratopsians and hydrosaurs that's kind of extend backward. Mm. So that muscle is actually inserting in front of some bite points to an extent that becomes a second class lever and that significantly increases that mechanical advantage but yeah so but what's weirder is though is that they're doing it in different ways hadrosaurs look like they're increasing their muscle vector Mm -hmm. ceratopsians are decreasing it (laughs) so you know there's a lot of there's convergence but there's also differences in how they get there so that's so fascinating um and sauropodomorphs also have this, you know, crazy diversity as well. Mm-hmm. Things like diplodocids here have much kind of more slender temporal muscles, but bigger palatal muscles. Um, things like uh, Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus, Macronarians, have more triangular adductor muscles and, you know, good-sized palatal muscle, but probably not to the extent of diplodocids mm-hmm. as much. So they, you know, Brachiosaurs have bigger, you know, spatulate teeth, they're cropping vegetation more versus diplodosis really they're just kind of cropping it with the front teeth and then swallowing it mm-hmm. but both are orthal feeders here are, uh more uh basal sauropodomorphs here like platyosaurus kind of have a bigger temporalis and good sized palatal um musculature um but you know there you can see how it kind of differentiated in different types of sauropods mm-hmm. uh, and I, again here's kind of a layout of the different traits that are different among them um interestingly between like things like diplodocoids like diplodocus and dicreosaurus and also titanosaurs which are macronarians mm-hmm. related to brachiosaurs um they convergently kind of slant the back of their head backward so that the the mu- basically, the temporal muscles are become a lot more skinny, like a like a tunnel, or kind of like a, you know, kind of just skinnier temporal muscles oriented forward, mm-hmm. kind of like bracing itself and lifting the jaw up. So they're kind of convergently coming to a similar uh, feeding apparatus, although still different because their teeth are a lot different. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, herbivorous theropods also. I find more interesting than the carnivores, but that's <laughs> fair enough. Um, yep. <laughs> very biased myself. Uh, they're actually very fascinating, and I've I've grown to like them very much as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, a lot of variation just among herbivorous theropods. You know, oraptor sores, for instance, have really big temporal and probably big palatal muscles. Wow. Versus canic methods are very small palatal right. uh, muscle here, pterygoideus, um, and kind of a reasonably side temporalis but the coronoid coronoid uh, region is very low in canignathids but much higher in everaptorids yeah. so you know that's interesting you know what's what's that what's that about you know i don't know i need to <laughs> look more into it and uh, you know ask the ask experts that have already looked into it look at their um studies like mm-hmm. ma at all uh, right, recently right. has some great work on that in that department um Ornithomimids, a lot of variation as well. They have a slanted back head, kind of like a diplodocid, but probably, you know, small and small, smaller palatal muscles, though. Mm. Uh, Dinochirids have a little bit of a flaring jugal, so I thought maybe their temporal muscles going forward, mm. and it kind of has that, it might have that capacity, so who knows, you know. Don't know anything about their feeding mechanism, but right. it'd be interesting. 
into. Anyway, lots of differences, variations. That's what I'm all about. It's like, how are these things different? And, you know, it's, anyway. Right. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just, you can see lots of convergences in different cranial muscle adaptations among different types of animals, like, you know, basal sauropodomorphs or prosauropods and stegosaurs and thessalosaurs have, you know, medi moderately sized temporal muscles um, and palatal muscles that get the job done. You know, orthos, maybe slight palinal or maybe not, maybe just kind of, you know, up and down. And things like stegosaurs might have slight mediolateral rotation, also thessalosaurids, because of their predenary and how they're articulated. Um, what I found interesting was that sauropods and stegosaurs, or sorry, and uh, pachycephalosaurs mm -hmm. uh, have kind of similar uh, cranial muscle features, which are very bizarre because they're very different <laughs> crania yeah. otherwise. Uh, but, you know, things like stegosaurus and diplodocus have some similarities. Their temporal muscles slanted backward and oriented forward more, kind of smaller. Their palatal muscles are huge. Mm. You know, just kind of very similar uh, traits in there. So I'm interested in looking in that more. Um, and then, of course, the palatal feeding variants, like in chylosaurs, hydrosaurs, and ceratopsians, which I've talked about. Mm. And especially, you know, this lateral... Um, attachment of big muscles in hadrosaurs and ankylosaurs might also help them in their uh, torsion uh, rolling of the jaw as well because it's kind of attached to the outside and when it pulls it actually would rotate the mandible inward a little mm -hmm. bit because of the way the muscle is um, attaching so and of course there's ton there are tons of great studies looking at and finite element analysis so basically uh taking CT scans or 3D models, uh, 3D scans or 3D models of dinosaur crania or any part of the body really, and breaking up into really small components and then how, kind of acting, activating a force of some kind to see, like a bite force for instance, kind of simulating that to see where the stresses, stress patterns move throughout the skull. Um, so there's a lot of fascinating stuff out there um, using that kind of methodology and it's really interesting to see like what parts of the skull would get more strain in them than others and does that match how the cranial muscles are you know the maybe the size of the cranial muscles like does that make sense like right. the, because the muscle would be smaller if it was bigger it would have a lot of strain so you don't want it to be you know, things like that um and last but not least it would be really great if we could find a lot more hyoids. Mm -hmm. So these are the bones underneath the jaw that have tongue muscles attached to them. Uh, but they're very scarce. But things like ankylosaurs look like they have a pretty big one. So yeah. if they had a very mobile tongues, tongues are very important in feeding. Mm -hmm. So the more we can get, you know, information about them, that would be awesome. But hopefully in the future we can right. find some more. But yeah, so anyway, so that's, <laughs> That's my stuff. I know. Like I said, sorry it took so long, but yeah, no problem. Uh, uh, anyway, so that was a fascinating talk. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've read some of your work before, but uh, definitely, I feel like that it made it, you know, a lot more structured in my head. I think so. That was very, oh, very helpful. And um, yeah, I think definitely um, a lot of people have a high interest in you know finding out how these dinosaurs were feeding and, um, yeah, and yeah. plus, so, you know, the implications for reconstructions of how they behave and of course the cheek issue. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I am, I'm actually uh, pretty glad to hear that you've learned to like at least the herbivorous theropods. Uh, oh yeah, was, no, yeah. they're great. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I'm a I'm a theropod guy myself, but I, yeah, I, can, I, I tend to tend to like the, the non macro predatory ones. So uh, we're, we're kind of awesome. kind of in the same boat there. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's in talk. fact, Let's... <laughs> yeah. In fact, I, I yeah. you know I, I would be interesting to it would be interesting to see to learn more about you know the feeding mechanics or musculature of like some of the yeah. weird um not not just the uh, Mesozoic theropods but also some of the weird uh, herbivorous birds that have existed in the past. So. Wow. Uh, Things like um, Gastornis, which was once thought to be predatory, but is yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah. you know, it's got a this big honking it's skull. So what were they doing with it? Um, some of the recently extinct types of um, uh, weird flight the stucks on Hawaiian islands. They're called the Moa Um oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So some of them have very, very odd skulls. So there's one called like the turtle jawed goose. Uh, 
uh, Shelly <laughs> Shelly Mechen, which, wow. which is named for that feature. And yeah, so you That's know, awesome. I think all, all this uh, all this kind of ties together. I think so. You know, maybe that could be your next. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, let's let's talk. That'd be great. I'd love to. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the more diversity, the better. It right. seems like there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so yes. Uh, if any of the viewers out there have questions about, you know, herbivorous dinosaur feeding mechanics or anything, please do send in your questions and uh, preferably send in your donations too. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Although I did um I did receive some um some. I guess requests or uh, earlier about people who are interested, and I guess this is quite topical since this is um, Dino Nerds for Black Lives. Yeah. About your um, position as a diversity chair of SVP. Uh, so you know, I guess what does that entail? Yeah. Um, so it, it's so this I should say this literally just happened yeah. um, like a week ago, maybe <laughs> right. a little bit more. Uh, so I yeah. haven't had a chance to actually. Uh, talk about it yet um with the with the committee and but i'm i'm really excited uh so so yeah basically i think it's it's the committee the uh, society has decided to kind of move to having a chair for the diversity committee and basically we're we want to do a lot more to help uh increase uh how we present diversity how we uh you know, interact with people of all backgrounds, right. um, and how and how we. So I've always been about embracing and harnessing the power of diversity, mm -hmm. and how how it actually is a really, really strong part of science. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I think that we have a. And looking at our field, like we've grown, we've grown quite a bit, but we still have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. And. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited to just kind of get into the thick of it and start talking to people, talking to everybody, talk, talking you know, both to the committee as well as just people in the society who have something to say. You know, I'm I'm all ears. I I want to know what you have to say, and I want to you know we want to we want to start making things work for everybody. Right. You know, so um, but yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I I'm I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's going to take a lot of work from everybody. Um, but yeah, we want to we want to hear from people of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I invite anyone who wants to share their stories. Um, and we're we're gonna you know try to you know. Can you say this? Sorry. No, <laughs> um, no worries. Yeah, just we want we want to know. We want to know your stories if you're willing to tell them, right. because I feel like the more stories are, that are told, um, the more everybody can start to appreciate what needs to be done mm -hmm. and what we can do to change. Because there's a lot of different little microaggressions that happen. Yeah. I know that you know when I when I was in grad school mm -hmm. and even an undergrad through grad school, I there I, I myself like you know, I, I consider myself kind of in the middle ground mm -hmm. between you know having having grown up in a with a more privileged background mm -hmm. but also having some so cause i'm have a mid i'm of middle eastern background mm -hmm. so and of uh you know muslim background right. um so there i i have had my fair share of uh you know racism thrown at me as well but I've I've more been interested in just kind of listening to everybody's mm -hmm. story because I feel like, you know, the more we know about people in our field that have a more in you know, th there's something about the interaction with other people in uh, in paleontology that really models how you kind of live throughout your grad school career and maybe your early career. Yeah. You know it it has a great impact, a really big impact on it. Not great, like, not good. You right, know? right. So, but a large one, uh, yeah. A large, yeah, has a large impact on it. And a lot of people tend to kind of, you know, they they take that for granted, especially right. people of more of privilege. They they kind of say, like, oh, you know, we're, we have, we're hiring this, uh, a, a new, we have a new black student or a new right. uh, Latin, Latinx student or, you know, something. This is great. We're increasing diversity. Yeah. That's not enough. We right. need to, we need to build a, uh, 
society, a structure, a right. structure, a community, society, yeah. a community in which we are, you know, aiding in their success. Right. You know, we whatever whatever we can do to help them help their success be everybody else's success. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody deserves the same uh, amount of. Man, my words are just terrible today. Yeah, I'm it's sorry. All right. <laughs> It's, I know, it's been a long week, uh, but yeah, everyone deserves the same type of experience, uh, and the, no one deserves to be treated poorly to get where they want to go. You know, yeah. there's no reason for it. There's absolutely, it's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. And um, for whoever is willing or wanting to tell their story, we're we're here to listen, mm-hmm. and we want to make change. Yeah, and so. I'm sorry, I was rambling. I was just <laughs> thinking no, of I say that, sometimes my words escape me. So. That, that all makes sense, uh, I think. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, obviously you mentioned that uh, you know, you have in under current conditions, you haven't exactly had much time to meet up with the committee and discuss this in, in detail. But you know what? Um, let's see. What kind of? Um, oh, we have a donation question, so maybe I'll okay. get to that later. Um, so. Someone said, uh, I'm a big fan of Dysonodonts, and I've read the work you've done on Sangusaurus. Uh, right. Do you think you <laughs> will ever come back to them in the future? Could they hold similar surprises? Thank you. I am actually working on something right now oh, with uh, Dr. Kenan Jelsik. Um, it's been a project. We, we presented it at SVP a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, yeah. and I still haven't written the paper for it. Right, right. Uh, but we're looking at the evolution of dysinodont feeding mechanisms oh, awesome. and looking at their jaw musculature. Yeah. Uh, it's this really exciting project, and I've been wanting to finally get to that manuscript and finish it up. Right. But, they, yeah, there are lots of interesting surprises in dysinodont feeding. You wouldn't expect it. Mm-hmm. You know, you think that, you know, dysinodonts have... Uh, you know, it's a dysinodon. Yeah, there's not yeah, much, they're all the same. <laughs> not much, but they're, the orientation of their temporal, temporal and maybe palatal muscles and just the way they are attaching and how they attach to the jaw, their mechanical advantage, there's a huge variety of them. Yeah. And just like, you know, canameriids versus stalicariids, mm-hmm. you know, canameriids, which are the, a very derived, large dysinodon mm-hmm. group, very long skull, yeah. you know, they're, uh, jaw muscle is oriented more backwards, so it might help in kind of uh, you know pulling the jaw right. side to side. Right, Versus right. stalicariids have a much more vertical um, uh, muscle orientation, so uh-huh. it pull it up. Right. And things like Sinusaurus have an extra lateral kind of extension, so those temporal muscles are pu- could be pulling it side to side yeah. as well. Uh, so wow. yeah, they're. they're fascinating and i've been wanting to get to this uh, yeah. manuscript and hopefully soon i'll be able to finish it right now i'm working on a manuscript of a book on dinosaur feeding biology with uh, yeah. D- dr dave white sample so we're trying to finish that up but once that's done or once it's in a good place i'm i'm getting to that manuscript i, mm-hmm. I really want that to be out there because it's really fascinating stuff that is fascinating. Are really cool. yeah and they're before i mean they came in before dinosaurs right. so they're the they're the primary big herbivore group. Mm-hmm. They weren't the first herbivores, but right. they were the first really, really big group of herbivores mm-hmm. and diverse group of herbivores. Right, so. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really very true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, yeah, that, that's a very interesting about that surprising uh, functional diversity. I, so yeah. I definitely look forward to seeing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's see. We have a bit bit more time left. Um, yeah, so anyways, what I was uh, working towards um, earlier before we got the Dyson yeah. question was, I, I guess... Um, well, what are some um, what are some steps do you think that you guys might be able to take to help foster the diversity, which is, as you say, so so important in in this field? Um, what are some things you can do, or even we we as a community can can do? Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah um, I think first and foremost is to listen. Right. You know, we can't we can't get anywhere until we start listening to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as I was, as I said before, everybody has a story to some capacity, and yeah. so if we don't listen, we don't know what needs to be changed. And we really listen. You know, we can't just like say, "Oh, you know, let's let's write a blog post about this person and then never talk about it again." Right, you know, like right. it's it's not like that. It's it's a lot deeper than that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, it, I think it's wonderful that you know, you know. We have we have a lot more women in paleontology, for right, instance. Right. Right now. 
but we also, I feel like especially we need to uh, start highlighting more women of color Mm -hmm. in paleontology too. Like that, like specifically, I mean, so because there are a lot of cool things that are, that a lot of women in color are doing and I, I'm seeing more and more on Twitter. It's just like, just fascinating. And you know, there, everybody it's, it's just shows that everybody is just as good, can be just as good as a scientist as anybody else. Yeah. And, you know, until we start listening and really trying to hone in on the, com- those, the components of their story that are actually impacting the way they're, perf- the way that, um, you know, others are, portraying their research or, or others maybe, you know, talking behind their, you know, cause I know I've had people talk behind my back yeah. about my research right, right. and it's, it's just different. And I, I, people say, Oh, you know, people, everybody gets people, you know, mm-hmm. has people talking behind their back or, right, right. you know, they're you know making snide remarks, mm-hmm. uh, you know, telling you that you, you're not good at this, you know, right. you're not, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, I've had my fair share of that, you know, that, that yeah. led to some, Difficulty for me, mm-hmm. and I know that definitely leads to difficulty in a lot of people. I know, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, so you know, it that we need we need to we need to get to the that we need to get to the core of those mm-hmm. issues. You right. know, right. Um, you know, steps we need to take. Listen, you know, talking committee, but you know, not just talk. We need right. to start, you know, <laughs> addressing the Theory concerns. Yeah. Yeah. We mm-hmm. need to start doing stuff, and. Um, you know, again, like I haven't talked to the committee yet, so it's it's hard for me to say exactly sure. what we're going to do. Sure. But we're going to do them, yeah. and yeah. we're <laughs> we're going to we're going to look at everything we can, that is possible mm-hmm. um, to foster a much better community in our society right. because right. we need so, it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and hopefully, actively discourage the you know absolutely yeah mm-hmm. yeah. yeah especially discourage yes. uh, any kind of bad mom. Yeah. Right, right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Um, all right. Let's see if there are any more questions. So please send in more questions if you have them. Um, yeah, we do have you know about three minutes left. I, I'll probably right. end, end a little short of the hour to okay, no give, time, problem. Yeah, give time yeah, for the great. next event. But um, also, um, I will also be kind of punching out after this because I've been hosting the stream for the past uh, eight hours or so. And, My goodness. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <Well> thanks, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me, both the viewers uh, and the guests. Uh, no, this is wonderful. Yeah. I, I think it's amazing what you all are doing. And, you know, kudos. This is great. This is really fun. Yeah. So thanks a lot for, um, you know, joining us today, Ali. Um, oh, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we, we do have some time. So I'll keep uh, waiting if, if uh, any questions are will come in. But yes, uh, fascinating talk. Uh, Thank you. Know, you. Obviously, all, always a hot topic with the, <laughs> with the cheeks and feeding the cats. Oh, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tried, I, you know, everybody warned me to not go into that. <laughs> right. And I was like, you know, I, I agree, but there's something's messing with my mechanics studies here. Right. And I can't, I can't, I can't not. Right, it. right. I mean, it, it's obviously relevant to, to the whole functional side of things. Right. Like, yeah. Like yeah. I can't just like stick to this model that people have reconstructed in the sixties. Like right, I need right, something. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure all the viewers probably found that very informative as well. Because uh, oh, yes, I, know. So. <laughs> I, I tend to ramble, so I'm sorry. I'm, if I it's it's was all good. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. So you know, everyone, uh, go on, go ahead and update your ornithischian and sauropodomorph <laughs> uh, restorations if you haven't already. All uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Love oh. to hear it. Yeah, there is a question. Someone asked, right. uh, are you on any social media besides Twitter? Uh, oh, wait, they said they found the Twitter. Okay. Oh. Uh, so, and anywhere else? Oh, okay. Or, yeah. yeah. At, at, so, at vert underscore anatomist is my Twitter handle. Um, mm-hmm. Other ones, I'm I'm on Instagram, although yeah. I don't use it very much, right. and I'm on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's pretty much the extent of what I'm Right. What I use as far as uh, social media, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I find Twitter has been really helpful, especially mm-hmm. at, you know looking at what's going on in the field, and also you know not only research but also just like you know social issues and right. everything. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Excellent. Really helpful. Yeah, yeah, Twitter's uh, pretty good for that, I've, I've found as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, let's see, it is uh, 55, all right. Uh, so I think we should probably bring this to a close around here. Uh, all right. So again, thanks for being with us. Uh, I will thank you. stop the stream momentarily and then you'll be free to go. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you.